theory that I mean like when, when someone uh, promotes exclusive representation I mean it sounds to me it's a little bit like um, there's a little bit of stick involved in that right as opposed to uh, a, a carrot uh, approach I mean is that maybe am I maybe I'm reducing that too much but it's but but I mean what's the theory that that people have if we do the exclusive representation these people will see that the guy they're working with or the woman they're working with next uh, next to them is doing better than they are, so they're going to want to join? Or what? what is the theory there? I don't know. I mean, that may be the theory, but I, I that's not how the discussion plays out a lot in the media um, and among the trade unionists that I've heard saying it, because it's getting more popular now because of Janice. So I'll take a stab at the theory. I think what you just said might be some people's theory. Um, it's just in practice it doesn't work that way. Right. So, um, But the biggest thing is, you know, I, part of the whole point of what organizing is versus what advocacy is, um, advocacy, sort of AERP, Greenpeace, you know, uh, you know, you write a check to someone, they go advocate on your behalf. Part of what organizing is, which is about building real power in this country, is about rebuilding a base of people who are resilient, who understand how to fight, and who can, in way larger numbers than we have right now, actually meaningfully participate in both like labor campaigns as well as the political process. We need way more people who are skilled in um, you know, the art of fighting, which is part of what happens when you build a big trade union movement, to get out there in the world and help make change right now. So I think part of what – there's two things. One is literally people say what, it's, like a, it's like reduced to a financial issue. Like why do we have to spend our lawyers' money of the union right. representing these workers? That's one argument, which, again, is just – it's so short-sighted, it's hard for me to even wrap my hand around it. And I think the second is... Maybe that one just sounds saying. vindictive and petty to me. I mean, it's just like... But there's uh, a lot of it. There, but there's a lot of that discussion out there. Like, I'm, it's all around right now. Like, why should we have to represent people who aren't paying their dues? And to me, um, yeah, it's... It's, it's, it's just losing sight it's, of what the point is. <laughs> the it's point, exactly losing sight of the point. The point is to build class solidarity, right? right. I mean, that's, to me... To me what a union um, does is it, it, it helps large numbers of workers remember that under a system called capitalism, which is a class-based system, they actually need to have class solidarity. And I, I don't take it for, as an organizer, I've never assumed that you wake up and there's something called class solidarity. That might be where I'm slightly different from, you know, I don't know, people who spend a lot of time with Karl Marx or something. Like, I don't assume that we wake up in the morning with a sort of class solidarity. I think that in, in an environment where you have a Fox News and you have um, a drumbeat of right-wing media with Sinclair, you know, taking over local radio stations and pumping out right-wing messages every day, I think I don't take for granted that workers just have solidarity. I think even if they're born with a sort of default solidarity, which I, maybe I do believe, but I think in the context of this country where we have not Sam Sater, unfortunately, booming into everyone's you know, radio in the morning when they wake up on Sinclair, we have some really right-wing forces who, like Trump, run a populist message that's fundamentally racist, classist, divisive, you know, divisive being the key word. The job of organizers is to help overcome what the media is doing um, to the hearts and minds of people in this country right now. And we are, you know, we're obviously with Trump in, we're seeing the logical conclusion of decades of this work. So um, a divided working class. So the idea of members only unionism, just it, it just, it continues the idea of having a divided working class where when I was working in a right to work state where the members could, frankly, not the members, wrong word, where the workers get to decide every day, am I paying dues to the union or not? I understood that my job was to spend most of my time or to have the, the resources of the union, which resources means really other great workers mostly, right, and staff. But, like, it's, it's that it drives us to go have a conversation day in and day out with the people who don't think that they need the union and to challenge them and help them come to see on their own that actually – a union is the best and smartest thing they could possibly ever have in their life. And we were successful at that. And there are other unions that are successful at that. So one, Janus is not the end of the world unless, you know, people have the idea that they're just never going to bother talking to workers. What is That's a, not what organizers do. All right. I, I mean, I want to get to to, uh, to to Murphy's Soap and whatnot, but, but what is, when you say, like, you know, when you, what, what, like, what are the practical things that you do 
to to get people to have that level of awareness like literally like what what do you do is it is it potluck dinners is it i mean we're gonna have bowling night is it all those oh god that's such a such a good question um i mean i would say that there are for some for some unions i'd say a lot of those things work and they're and they're useful um and certainly building sort of social you know time works but not not in my experience really and here's why um like i there's even a joke in the labor movement um you know, just food get people to meetings? Like, I take the position that I don't serve food. Like, <laughs> I, think there are, I, think, I think in today's climate, where the working class is strapped, where people are often working two full-time jobs or way too hard on one job, they have kids, they have family, they're completely exhausted. I mean, the conditions are so bad in this country right now that for most people to decide to do, to, to, to do something other than go home, um, it's, it's going to have to be because they understand that it has meaning in their lives. And food is not the central reason for meaning in people's lives, like in terms of meet, you know, food at meetings. I mean, I'm sort of joking, but I'm actually not. We, we could have all debate about food at meetings because there is a debate about that among organizers. So um, I take the position that it's at work, it's in the workplace, it's on break time, um, it's on the lunch break, it's on the 15-minute, we still have, you know, the theory of 15-minute mandated breaks for workers who have employers who follow the law. You know, you have to have four of them in an eight-hour shift. Okay, so, like, there's time at work where workers can have conversations with their coworkers, and those conversations need to be about things, like, that matter to them in the workplace. So um, I prefer having, for example, um, a short duration to the collective bargaining agreement, to a contract. Why? Because workers pay most attention and participate at the highest level um, during contract negotiations, right? Because they understand their benefits, their, their, all the terms and conditions of work, their money, that that's going to actually uh, be determined in their contract. So for organizers who believe in high participation and building high participation class solidarity, um, for example, there's another theory, like I, so I, I subscribe to the short contract theory, because if every couple of years we have to go back to the bargaining table, um, we can get you know, like 90%. I mean, I always leave 10% out there as having some ideological right-wing reason why they grew up opposed to a union. But if, if we can get 90% engaged, which is what we got engaged in a right-to-work state called Nevada, if we can get 90% of all workers, you know, who, who may have different local party affiliations, by the way, involved in understanding that they themselves together can make changes in the workplace. They can fight for child care. They can fight for, oh, an end to sexual harassment. They can fight for higher wages. They can fight for um, fairness in scheduling. Like, Th- those are the issues that unify the working class. So fairness and scheduling, like a, she- you know, the idea that's like. So I'm not into let's have a pizza party and try and get the workers to come because they probably think I have better food at home with my wife or my husband. You know what I mean? So the question right. is, if if what we do is help people understand, we can solve really serious problems that are affecting workers in their workplace. Um, that's what actually holds people's interest. So. It's being deliberate about contract surveys. It's being deliberate about there's something called like the service versus the representation model. Part of the unions that are going to fall hard um, in the Janus, you know, in a post-Janus climate are the sort of unions that adhere most strictly to business unionism, by which I mean um, – uh, we represent they file you. file a lot of grievances. Right. Yeah, like they're, it's an advocacy model, right. basically. It's what I'm so critical of, right? It's like an advocacy model. Like you pay us your dues. If there's a problem at work, you file a little grievance, and, you know, some big guy's going to go take care of that grievance and work it out with the boss. Okay, that's the death of the labor movement. That has been the death of the labor movement. For those of us who are from an organizing model, and there's many of us, not at all just me, right? I'm just trying to lift up the difference. Like I decided to write, begin writing books because I think organizers don't write books. So people don't know what we do, and I'm trying to explain the difference between what organi- how organizers view the world and how lawyers view the world and how, you know, yeah, it's basically lawyers and, or- and organizers at this point in terms of who has the voice. So, you know, it's a very different view of the world. Um, and for, for me, it is primarily about how do we find out what are the set of issues that matter most um, to workers in the workplace. That's how we build Um, collective power. That's how we build their interest. That's how we get them to stay for an important meeting. And so the alternative for organizers to the traditional grievance, what we call the grievance mill model of unionization, is what we call the direct action approach to problem solving in the workplace. So um, when I was in Nevada, or any union I've worked in, you know, let's say that a a complaint comes forward. 
Um, we have a contractual, we, we've won contractual language because we built a big 90% you know, participation contract struggle. We've won good language around, let's say, scheduling or overtime. And suddenly you've got a manager on the third shift who's screwing with everyone's schedule in a way that's a violation of the contract. Under a business union model, the lawyers come in, you file a grievance, maybe a steward files a grievance and eventually goes to arbitration. Workers have nothing to do with the solution. They don't takes, see, they don't see what, what, they don't what happens. See it, they hardly right, participate. Right. It takes usually takes two years to like get to arbitration right. under a union contract. The workers aren't involved in it. It's a bunch of, you know, top heavy people talking about, you know, how to, what the solution is. In a direct action approach, which is what organizers use, we're like, okay, let's start by having everyone in this unit on this shift write up a petition that says we demand to enforce the contract page, blah, 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 da, da, da. Um, and that's the first step. And why is it? Because it forces the workers to have a conversation with each other about what's happening on that shift. Right. So I would always say, <laughs> I want no, no less than 90% of the signatures on the workers on a shift on a petition around, let's just use that overtime example or scheduling example. Let's go out, let's have workers talk to their coworkers. Not um, because the 90% is, is going to necessarily have an impact, but it means that at least 9 out of 10 people on that floor or in that um, uh, whatever, that shift, are aware of the issue and have talked to uh, people and have been contacted. Yes. Right, okay. Aware and agree that there's a problem. Hi, folks. Sam Cedar here. We still need your help on our Patreon page. YouTube ads have come back, but not nearly as much as we had before. So if you can help us out, any little bit helps. Head over to our Patreon page right at this URL, and you'll help us keep helping you by making videos.